to the presentation? Um, well, as people are kind of joining, I can go ahead and introduce and just go over a couple of points and then I'll hand it over to you, Dell. Cool. Perfect. Um, good morning, everybody. My name is <clears throat> Morgan Alanji. I'm a AmeriCorps member with Conservation Nebraska. Thanks for joining us this morning. Um, just a couple <clears throat> items to go over. Your camera and your screens are shut off, um, microphone shut off as well. So um, if there are any questions today, please leave those in the chat um, or the Q&A section. And hopefully after our presentation, we can go over a few of those. And we are here today with Del Fike. And I will hand it over to you, Del, if you want to give us a little introduction and we'll get started. Sure. Well, thank you for having me. Um, again, I know I, I did a presentation with this group uh, about a year or so ago. I love what you guys are doing. Um, I know you guys have been involved in other things that we've done uh, with the Graze Master Group. Uh, with all that being said, I'm Del Fike. I'm one of the founders of the Graze Master Group. Carrie Hofsnyder is the other founder. Um, she's actually traveling today, so she won't even be on to, to help bail me out if I, I have problems here. So um, the Graze Master Group started as a breed of cattle that we trademarked in 2015 that we call the Graze Master, that we built over a probably a 25 or 30 year span. Ever since I got out of high school, I was, I was hell bent on trying to build the perfect beast and not the perfect beast for every place on earth, but one that was acclimated, um, you know, especially to our forages and what we were trying to do here with you know, the end result and have a really efficient um, animal that grazed year round. So background is, is heavy in, it's heavy in cattle, um, large scale farming operation. And we changed all that a few years ago, went to a very small operation and really started to concentrate on, on soil health and, and really the regenerative ag parts. <clears throat> when we started doing it, Way back in 1999, when we started doing the first covers and stuff, you know, regenerative agriculture wasn't even a phrase. And so we, we've kind of been at it for a while. We continue to learn every day. I, I get the chance to consult um, all across the country and then a little bit globally. And then we're also involved in um, some imperative inputs, biological things like that. Uh, and our biggest part of our portfolio now is uh, with the Agoro Carbon Alliance, where we go out and help people uh, get their farmer ranches into a carbon sequestration program, which at the end of the day, if, if that all goes away, we, we know we've made the soil better through, through that. And uh, if it doesn't, that's great. You know, people continue to, to get some rewards off of that. So that was a uh, kind of a long introduction. I know there's going to be some slides in here that we can touch on more, but um, I'm just very honored, you know, once again, to be working with you guys. So we can go to the next slide. So this was a picture my wife took years and years ago. Um, we still use it a lot. Our, our goals have certainly changed over the years, but the profitability, you know, one of our, our, our biggest catchphrases, balancing nature and profitability. So when we got into this years ago, people were saying, well, you can be profitable or you can do good things for nature. And I'm like that. I do not believe that. My grandfather, that's not what he taught me. He was a naturalist and he's like, you can have that balance, you can make a good living, you can do good things, you can have a healthy family, community, and things like that. So it's just kind of a cool way to, you know, that we think about, we do have to make ends meet, um, but we wanna have a whole bunch of fun. And farming has become so industrialized and not much fun. And um, I'm sure someplace in here it is show too, but I equate what farmers or ranchers uh, or they're suffering from the Stockholm syndrome. 
where they become friends with their captors. And they really don't know any other way or any other options because they you know their backyard's very small. They, uh, they don't get the chance to see a lot of different things. It's just what that person or that company close to them is selling. And that's why we wanted to have something that, you know, is a hundred percent legit that uh, we want to save them money. We want to get rid of things. We want to make the soil better. We, we want to make them, you know, have a better life. And, and uh, like the bottom of this says, it leaves more time for fun and we got to enjoy life. <clears throat> my sister passed away. One of my sisters passed away on Thanksgiving and it, it was my business partner. And it really, really opened my eyes to, you know, tomorrow is promised to no one and every breath is, is very special. And I've got a lot of work to do yet and I'm trying not to waste time. And, and uh, I'm just trying to do a lot of things a little bit better with a, with a lot more heart. And so this presentation is perfect uh, with a group like this that really understands it. Next slide, please. I started to tell you a little bit about the <clears throat> by Cal Company Grazing Master story. I do know I wish our pastures were that green like they were four or five years ago. I mean, our third year of drought has has uh, made us having to do a lot of realigning and um, a lot of revamping. But one thing we found out is what we've done with the soil has really added a lot of resiliency. And when we do get some rain, or even those times when we don't get a lot of rain, we're still holding a lot of moisture in that soil. So that, that's a, on our home place. We'll, we'll get into size and everything like that because people are always interested um cows are my deal uh i thought they were all my deal until the soil health um part came along and i'm not a soil scientist i'm, I'm a soil romantic and if, if there's one quote i love the most about me or a comparison if several people said you're, you're just like walt whitman of soil so you guys are in for probably a lot of philosophy and, and crazy thoughts but you will think differently when we get done talking a little bit if you can bear with me that long next slide please so we're just west of lincoln nebraska 14 miles straight west on highway six uh we're rolling hills small patches we normally get 30 plus inches of rain we have no irrigation we are four miles from the aquifer it starts four miles west of us um, we have very limited groundwater and our biggest well pumps 15 gallon per minute. And that was really a big part of the genesis of building, building our own breed of cattle. We needed to make them you know, accountable. We needed to make them work really well with what we provide them, but they also had to do it on less water. And so the breeds that we put through there, my dad was still alive years ago, he tested um, water intake for two years on all the breeds that we had put in our composite and it's it's amazing how you know the, the, how much less water some breeds take than others and we we really honed in on that and so these are acclimated to our environment and then also with an end product of you know really good tasting meat that we run through our little local meat business that my daughter-in-law helps me with and uh so yeah it's uh, there again i wish it was as green as that picture was from probably 10 years ago but we'll get back there everything's cyclical so next slide and if anyone has any questions i mean we can wait till the end or you can however you guys want to handle it is fine so he's got a burning question that's cool um, I, I did have an amazing childhood. It was really good until I was about 14 to 16 years old. The 80s farm crisis hit. And my dad didn't sign any, co-sign any of my notes, but I co-signed his notes. I had a group of registered her for cows that were paid for. I had equity in those. My dad didn't have a ton of debt, but what he had was bothering him. I drove past the bank one day when I left high school and I asked his good friend, the banker, I said, how can I help my dad? He was really stressing about this. And and uh, we put those against the debt we had and, and uh, begun to 
really change our ways of thinking even way back in you know the, the mid 80s so by the age of 20 my dad had turned the entire operation over to me which really he almost had when i was 16 but uh succession early succession and getting the next generation involved is very very much the fike way out here and my son already takes over everything he's he's been doing everything for quite a while uh, so we did, a, we continued our seed stock operation, had quite a few more cows than we do now. And we began to rent farm ground because the opportunity was there. People were getting out. Um, we had some, a pretty good reputation with a lot of families and, and we, we started to rent quite a bit of ground. In 1999, we were up to 7,000 acres of pasture row crops. Everything was farming with my cousin. We were running about 200 cows. We were losing a lot of money on the farm ground, even though we thought we were so innovative. Started a no-till in 1987, cover crops in 99, and we were still like, we're not making money. We were still buying too much machinery. We were still doing a lot of things we shouldn't be doing. So luckily in June of 99, I stepped out of a tractor after being in there all day and my legs were numb. And I fell to the ground, called, luckily I had a, a business band radio and called for help. They came 21 days. I laid on the couch, um, basically paralyzed before they could do any surgery that really helped me because they didn't really have the person that could do it here. Uh, so that, I mean, it gives you some time to think about perspective. I've had multiple back surgeries since then. And the back surgeries are the best thing that ever happened to me because it got me out of what I was doing that was really a dead end um, into seeing a lot of amazing things I could do. Uh, ended up getting a chance to go back to go to college for the first time. I didn't get to go in 1985. My dad had a heart attack. And so I was I was here planting and doing all that stuff. Never really liking the farming side as much as the cows. And uh Got a degree in radiology, and then my back blew out again. I couldn't position patients. And so then I got another uh, associate's degree in coding and billing, hospital administration, and ended up managing a medical clinic in Lincoln for four and a half years until I returned back to to this. I got healed up and, and learned a lot and was ready to come back. So next slide, please. So where everybody's at today, and you will really get in talking about soil health, stuff like that, but there's so many things that people do that I was doing that don't need to be done. Things that are really detrimental to the soil, to our bottom line. Um, do we need all that machinery? Do we need to be doing all that? Um, is there different ways to eliminate chemicals? Is there different ways to add some nitrogen to the soil in a natural way. I mean, the, the air is mostly nitrogen. Why are, why are we buying nitrogen and putting it on and, and then it leaches and runs off and goes into wells and things like that. And I, I really decided I didn't need all the stuff we were putting on those cattle. We seemed like we were running a cow, these cows through the chute constantly and we didn't need to. We just needed to get them back to a all natural environment. We got them out of the dusty, muddy pens and started to graze year round on cover crops on grass and, and yes, still using some hay from time to time and, and the cattle got healthier. Um, the farm started to get healthier. And of course the soil just started to explode where we were really intensive grazing these cattle and, and getting those recycled nutrients you know, on that soil and, and seeing plants come back or at least for the first time that I got to see a lot of them because all the seeds are still in the soil bank. And, and I never really believed that until we started to aggressively graze um, for a short period of time and get those cattle off. And then beautiful things come. And I tend to get lost in the, in the flowers out in the pasture now. And, and, uh, and that's a pretty good place to be. Next slide. So yeah, from 7,000 acres to 700, we're less than 500 now. Uh, we reduced all our inputs. 
rebuilding of the soil was critical. Intensive grazing. Uh, we fence, move cows at least once a day, maybe twice, using portable fencing so they can go through, uh, take half, tromp the rest into the soil. We move them to the next spot. Manure, urine is the quickest way to get nutrients to that soil. And everything really starts that beautiful cycle. And, and you know, the, the carbon side of it, you know, banking on the photosynthesis and what it does through those plants. And, and um, you know, it, like I said, people can believe in it or not, but we're, we're making soil better and we're making individual operations better. Um, and, and, and hopefully we're doing a really big part of it too. Bottom one is finding the right genetics. Most cattle are not the right genetics that are on these operations. They're too big. They're too, um, they're too dependent on a lot of inputs. And that's exactly what the industry wanted these people to have happen. They wanted them to rely on them for everything. And we just kind of turned that upside down and built these cattle to work with what we had. The ones that didn't, of course, they fell out of the herd, went to the meat program, whatever. We had very little fallout when we started to do it this way because we had been working so long on these cattle to, to really get them acclimated. And um, it's, it's made our life a million times better. We went from calving in the cold, because <clears throat> that's what everyone said we should do, to calving in, in May, a um, little, little bit in April, but mostly in May and they calve on grass. They have no calving problems. The calves are up, they're healthy. They don't receive copious amounts of vaccines or anything like that. So, you know, when, when people say a lot of these things can't be done, we've basically done them all right here. Not, not really to prove people wrong, but so we can help other people design their programs. So once again, their lives are better, they're more profitable. Next slide, please. Oh my gosh, we got some some Greek philosophy here, and and yeah, love, wisdom, all that good stuff. But holding holding those earthworms in that soil with all that pore space and that the beautiful aggregates and those oh my, it's just it's euphoric. It's beautiful when you start seeing the earthworms come. You know that you're doing the right thing with the soil. Um, a lot of times where we graze these cattle. And, you know, we haven't had any earthworm activity. Usually the earthworms come, if there's some additional moisture, the earthworms come right away. Usually in a day or two, you'll start seeing them underneath those cow pies and, you know, all that kind of stuff, which is, you know, your macro indicator that you're starting getting, getting the soil right. And then, you know, what the excrements from the worms are the best fertilizer on earth. So we know that we can build soil really fast. And it's not more management, it's just different management. So you, we may manage it different than other people. We may you know, not plant quite the same, or we may have cattle on there one season on cover crops instead of you know, some cash crop. But it's all in the cycle and it, it's all very diversified in a very holistic way. Most of the things we're doing in agriculture or we've done and the U.S. takes the absolute um, top prize for depleting soil faster than any other civilization in the history of man. Most civilizations, it took them thousands of years. You know, we're 250 to 300 years into this deal. Nearly all of our soils are depleted in one way, shape, or form. When we start seeing the earthworms come back, we know there's true hope. Uh, even though there's some areas that we're probably never going to get earthworms, it's too dry. There's other indicators, different plants coming back. You know, the resiliency of, of uh, I was just in New Mexico not too long ago and seeing different grasses come back that they haven't got to see for, you know, a century because we changed the way they graze. So it it's not, it's a bit of an art and it's a bit of a love affair but it's really just everything that's already been done. Um, East Coast, early 1800s, they were using cover crops like crazy. Of course, manure from livestock, livestock operations until the 80s. 
you can usually tell around building sites, the crops are still a little bit better, even if they haven't had livestock on them for 50 years, because a lot of the manure was spread close where it was convenient. And so there's just little, there's little hints that we just need to look for and see, you know, that worked really well or what didn't work well. And it's, it's really a nice balance and it's, and it's very profitable, not just the savings part to start with, but um, you, you stop thinking about highest yields to highest net profit per acre. And maybe the yields aren't as high as you used to have them, but your profit per acre, which is the actual money, not the bragging rights. I know it's hard for farmers to, to get through that sometimes. The actual money is, you know, what they live off, what they pay those notes with, you know, how they, how they uh, you know, get the next generation back and things like that. So that's a lot of that's a lot of weight tied on a little earthworm's back, but it's pretty cool. And Charles Darwin has a great book. I was just looking; I don't see it in my huge stack. Um, a great book about earthworms. If you guys want to take a look at it sometime. Next slide. So yeah, everything's already been done. We've screwed this up millions of times. We've we've tried to correct it. Um, I don't know that everything is cyclical. I think humans are cyclical in how stupid we are sometimes. And I was the king of that being really stupid with all this. But there's a lot of things that will save us. Um, animal impact. We get to work with a lot of conservation groups that are, you know, anti-cow. And we have them come out and we show them some little patches of prairies on some neighbors' farms where there, hasn't, there, there haven't been cows, you know, in 70 years. Most of that grass is matted down. Um, it's dying. It's choked out. Um, there's very few species. And we take them to the other side of the fence and show them where we're grazing it hard for just a little bit of time, maybe a couple times a year, and giving it a nice rest period. And how we'll have hundreds of differences of different species in that and we really haven't had anyone from any of those groups leave going you know that's a lie they're just like we've never got to see it like that and so there's value in our cooperation there's value in the community part of of just getting together with you know deals like this field days things like that 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 really have a great impact on the, the neighboring and the understanding that we're really all in this together and we have to make it work because it's if we don't, uh, the results are not going to be good. Next slide. You can go past that one. I already talked about that one. So yes, I totally suffered from that to the point where we weren't a million dollars in debt with machinery um, loans, we were a million dollars worth of payments in a year. And yes, we farm large scale and we, we custom farmed a lot and things like that. But it's really, it's really eye opening and so rewarding to see when you can send some of that stuff down the road. And yes, somebody else can use it. Maybe they'll change down the road. But, you know, just getting that responsibility and all that liability off your place and and then seeing that, you know, you can do things with not much money, with not much investment. And it might be more hands-on than what people are used to, but it's going to be a lot more rewarding financially, physically, health-wise. It's all going to be a lot better. And that's, that's the beauty of this. You know, if you can convince people that they can make more money, they will fall in love with the beauty of soil health. And everyone has a light bulb moment. You know, and I always ask people, you know, when they're changing what those moments are. And um, I think I've had a, a, a multitude of, of moments. Of course, I'm a slow learner, so it's taken me a little bit longer. But um, it, it really is. There's a lot of epiphanies that you need to have. And then when it finally sinks in, it's, it's, a, it's a beautiful thing to start really running with because it does make your life better. Next slide. Yeah, I've never allowed education to get in the way of my learning. And we do have a whole bunch of unlearning to do. There, there's a lot of people that have been trained through this system. 
and not it's not their fault they were trained into through these systems that maybe were getting some money from areas that um, didn't have their best interests at heart so the the reprogramming or, or talking to some of these people gets a little hard because they're scared and naturally you would be you know if you've done it this way and it's kind of working but yet you know it's every year you're putting more inputs in and you're getting the same or less all the expenses are higher fertilizer for example what if you could put some something in your variety of cover crops like we use hairy vetch and things like that to sequester fix nitrogen eliminating a lot of that need or that expense but people don't know that until they start talking to other people or or listening to things like this or having you know people like me come out to the place and and really kick over the rocks and say hey you have a lot of opportunity here and a lot of potential we just need to tweak it a little bit and start going a different way next slide So half jokingly, and those are two Grace Master bull calves that we sold a few years ago. Um, I kind of demand the most accountable cow, maybe not on earth, but she's she's got to work for us. Um, and everybody said, well, you're probably running them hard and things like that. No, our cattle are in absolute heaven all the time. And they only have one bad moment in their lives. And that's when they when they go to get turned into meat products and things like that, because their lives are amazing. They're grazing on things that haven't been around here for, for decades. And, and that's a big part. And, you know, we, we balance the right genetics where we can run more cattle, maybe a smaller size cow, run more on each acre, um, maybe, you know, really adopting intensive grazing, in every area, not just on one, one place, you know, across your whole operation, but it does equate to building really good soil. And we are nothing without the soil. Next slide. So this is a field that's just right south of my house. Um, so we get a lot of people say, you know, it can't be done in heavy clay soils. And like I say, I'm not a soil scientist. They can bust all kinds of chemistry stuff and all that apart when I talk, that's that's great. But what we did see is we, we took something that was fairly depleted, but not as depleted as most fields are from 2.6 to 6.9% organic matter in a decade. So when you start looking at that, it, it's, it's, I think, and I can't see it super slow, but, it, or super small. Uh, there's a lot of different things in there that show profitability indicators in a very natural way. So it's, it's way above in a lot of different areas. There's nitrogen available there for the next crop. You know, we're developing pore space so more water can infiltrate and we can hold more water. And that's in part to, you know, using cover crops and things like that, that, that have uh, beautiful, big, fibrous roots that rot, that the earthworms can come, start following that and depositing their nutrients. And it's really the balance that it takes to do this really fast. So this was cover crops, spring and fall. This was cows, spring and fall. And sometimes we even grazed this particular field year round. So we'd had a lot more animal impact than, than normal which is gonna be hard to do in Eastern Nebraska where we run out of time to get cover crops drilled in the fall and you know things like that. It's just got, there's a lot of different ways we need to look at it. This particular field, we just wanted to home run and see how fast we could do it. And this one is actually dropped. It, it was up about 8% organic matter. And then it started to go down a little bit but our carbon sequestration tonnage numbers went through the roof, which we really thought that this is really good soil. Um, how is it possible to sequester more carbon on really good soil? Because it's probably sequestered a bunch. Will there be an increase? What we're finding out is in a lot of these fields, um, it becomes more of a sponge. And uh, we, we do see some really good carbon tonnage numbers. 
which is there if you're in a program, it's it's valuable because you're making money on the tons you're selling the carbon company. Next slide. Oh, we can't have a slide without cow manure, without cow poop. Um, I've been known to slam on the brakes when I see a beautiful cow pie like this with all the little holes in it and proclaim to everyone how exciting this is. So we're seeing dung beetle activity. That's what all those little holes are. And so the dung beetle is, uh, is pretty important to your operation. And we had them when I was a kid. And then when we started using a lot of porons and dewormers uh, and harmful fly sprays, things like that, they all left. And so when we took that all away and went to a real natural type approach, the dung beetles returned. So two things on a, well, there's actually three things, earthworms, dung beetles, and when you hear the birds, the birds start coming back, you know you're starting to get in balance. But there's, I think there's thousands of dung beetle species, but these come through and really, really start to pepper that and make that so it breaks down easier so that it goes back into the soil faster. And we've had some dung beetle activity where just, you know, about three days, it just takes, there's nothing left. And that's really what we want to see. And so once again, it's balancing nature. It's letting nature apply the nutrients and letting the rest of nature, you know, deposit those nutrients where you know where the crop where the where the grasses and, and legumes and things like that can really get a hold of it you know it's it's basically the nutrients from that pasture from that paddock but it's recycled it's available right away to go back in the soil and so it's a pretty good way to do it and especially when you can intensively graze and have a bunch of cattle on each of those paddocks every day and it's really covered and and I say yeah, it sounds exciting. I know everybody's like, we need to move on from this. So let's do. So that's a little uh, manure talk. So in one acre of healthy soil contains around one million earthworms, and that's a rough guess. Um, but at that rate, they would deposit seven hundred pounds per day per acre of nutrients. So when we think about that, we don't need any other nutrients when we get the soil balanced right. And that that picture is actually taken in a spot where we would have grazed triticale and hairy vetch. You can see it kind of laying flat. The cows ate what they wanted and, and tromped the rest into the soil or, or left it for armor on the top. But the earthworms are coming to feed off of the manure and urine that the cows left. And they're really opening that up, um, you know, for water infiltration and, uh, you know, nutrients that can get down there faster in a very natural way. Next slide. Oh, yeah. Manure and urine trivia. The average cow applies 75 to 100 pounds of manure and urine per day. God created the best nutrient management fertilizing machine on earth in in these ruminant animals and it's it's really cool to think about that and we can even bolster that we can make that better so say these cattle in this picture they're on alfalfa some red clover some brome grass things like that so the 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 nutrients that they're putting back are like i said just recycled from that field so a lot of times we'll bring some hay in and bio carpet it where we just unroll it let the cows eat what they want, uh, translocate some seed, tromp the rest into the soil. And then we're incorporating different nutrients from a different farm. We try to buy a little hay from different farms and things like that. So those nutrients then go through the cow and they're a little bit different in their whole recycled process. The feeding hay can make you money and people like argue with me all the time about this. When we budget hay, we put we budget 60% going to soil improvement and 40% for the cow um, through biocarpeting or bale grazing, which we'll get to some pictures here after a while. There's really no way to improve the soil faster than those two deals um, 
with cattle and, and especially then translocating some seeds too. Next slide. Bale grazing. So you can see to the left, um, those are some old cow tracks or something going down to a creek. So over the years, it looks like those are some, probably some rye bales, probably have some other seeds in it. We put them in those spots. So it really, you know, that soil's bare. There's been some erosion. We put them in those spots, let the cows eat what they want. Um, they'll leave a nice mat there that starts holding and rebuilding the soil in those spots. And we've actually had some where they were three foot deep, you know, in, in some really bad spots. Um, very few like that, but we've got one spot in particular where we've, we've done that the past four or five years. And now we have soil um, straight across the top. And, you know, all we did was let the cows do their work and, and, and put the bale out precisely where they where we need them. And the bale grazing works great for what we call those rescue areas like that. And we've done it on large scale areas too, but I, I like the bio carpeting uh, where we're unrolling that bale because we're getting more, more exposure and more seeds uh, spread out through the field or pasture. Uh, next slide. Just some cow-calf pears eating some bales we got for the bale grazing part. The next slide, when we get to it, it I'm going to show you. Yep, yeah, perfect. So that's a spot where we had put one alfalfa bale. You can see it's super dark green where I'm standing, and then it gets a little lighter on the outside. It tested 4.92 tons acre of dry matter where we grazed that bale. Outside the grazed area, it only tested 1.79 acres of dry matter. It's, that's based on how much forage is there. The difference is 3.13 tons per acre if we did it across all the acres by simply placing a bale on the ground and feeding it there. So it, it kind of blows your mind that you can do it that fast. We could build two to three inches of topsoil by bale grazing in three months. And that's that. Most people mind their minds because, you know, that's old saying is a thousand years or whatever to get an inch of topsoil. We can do it fast. And, you know, the cattle are the way to do it. Um, a lot of different livestock help that. Next slide. There's some aftermath of biocarpeting. You can see the cattle ate what they wanted. They tromped the rest in. There's manure and urine spread all across where that bale was. And normally we always bale or bio carpet different types of bales than what the grass that is in that established stand so then you can really see the difference the next year on uh you know what was in that bale so if there were some clovers or some alfalfa or you know some warm season grasses you know in, in a cool season area you know we incorporate those or translocate them through this deal too but that whole mat to start holding that moisture and stabilize that soil and feed it with the nutrients. It's, it's a, it's a very profitable uh, enterprise. Next slide. Okay. That's a, that's a field or a pasture that was never seeded. That was taken out of row crop production about 15 years ago. We biocarpeted. We brought really old CRP bales in from a neighbor. They were super, super um, far along, and there was a lot of seed in there. And for two years, we just unrolled bales along the contour of the terraces. And NRCS came out a few years ago and said there were 70 to 100 different species of warm season grass, clovers, things like that. Now, most of that was brought in with the translocation of the seed through that, but all that seed is also in the seed in the soil bank yet. And so the tromping, the, the hoof action of those cattle on there very aggressively going after, you know, what we were unrolling, I'm sure brought that seed closer that was in the soil. We see new species there all the time. And we kind of call that our, part of our pasture or prairie rehab program where we we do very little uh, work, work. We let the cows do the work and we're getting these pastures turned back to more their native state. 
Next slide. That's just another picture of, of you know, that grass in that area. The cedar on the front of that utility vehicle is how we seed most of our seeds out in the pasture if we need to do some overseeding of some culvers or something like that. Um, we'll, we'll run that through that, that broadcaster. We've probably done, since we've got that, probably we've done four or 5,000 acres because we've been over ours so much and did some for our neighbors. But uh, we put it on the front instead of the back so we could see the width, the pattern that it spread, and also if, if it was getting low. And I can usually overseed, it's in a pasture I know, I can usually overseed or broadcast um, about 70 acres in an hour with two to three pounds of clover seed. So it's pretty fun to do it too. Next slide. Yeah, back to hay. Hay in the regenerative world of all these people that complain about a lot of different things, they'll tell you hay is the worst thing on earth. And I like to have some hay. I like to build soil with hay. I like to have it when we get a foot of snow. Um, there's just a lot of things uh, that we like hay for. And hay is a profitable, buying hay is a profitable uh, part of our operation, which is crazy for people to try to wrap their heads around. Next slide. So yeah, of all the acres we're still running, we've really only maximized those four acres that I talked about that we went from 2.6 to 6.9% organic matter. Uh, the cool part about it, I will never... Uh, I will never need more land. If I lived at 200 years old, I'll never be able to optimize or maximize each acre of my soil. So it would be totally maddening for, for me to think now that I should ever expand where back in the day I couldn't get enough land. And it's a really an indicator now when you see people start getting smaller in their operations that they're probably really profitable. And we found that out pretty quickly when we got things Going in the right direction, we came. We become uh, about eighty percent more profitable with five to seven hundred acres than seven thousand. Next slide. So yeah, the people that tried to sell me stuff stopped stopping by. They're still. I still know them. I still see them. I still wave at them. They're still perplexed on what I do. Um, they they began to ask you know what what are we doing why why are we doing this and why is it working and that was a group uh, from NPR in Washington they come out followed me this has probably been five or six ago and we just talked about the philosophy of you know balancing nature and and uh, you know the cow and really with the modern times of how none of that makes sense but we can take a step back. And, and really take a breath and see that we can be really profitable and we can make this soil and this the environment really good. It can it can be done. So yeah, they're they're asking me, you know, what what's my my secret? And I'm just yeah, we're letting cows be cows. They calve on their own. You know, we we do control them in their grazing. But it's a year round, beautiful, holistic system that works very well, and it can work any place on earth. Next slide. A uh, lady that wrote a chapter about me in a book from Germany. She could not understand my excitement with good soil. And I kept telling her, dirt doesn't smell, soil smells beautiful, it's a drug. And I finally shoved some in her face and I said, take a big old hit, you know, really take it in, smell it. It's medicinal, it's spiritual. And her husband's taking a picture of me in the other picture while I think she was probably sniffing more soil. She got it. She has a full understanding now on, you know, just that quick difference in we get this right. We change the whole, the whole world pretty fast. Next slide. Uh, that's just in that field where we had had the good results. That was forage sorghum, sorghum sedan, sun hemp. Um, I think there's about 10 different mixes in there and we just, we put up fence. So we let the cows graze in that. 
eat what they want, tromp the rest in. And that's a beautiful plant to really start those channels to get that water and those nutrients, uh, you know, in different spots in that soil. Next slide. That's just one of the heifers that was grazing and that looks like there's some millet in that little patch where she's at, but they, they are definitely content. They're, they weren't suffering too bad. Next slide. Yep, we just gotta work together. Um, we can't be working. It doesn't matter political or religion or anything. We have to work together and uh, else it's not gonna work. And, and uh, we see it works all over the world. Next slide. So yeah, there's our contact info. You can go to the grazemastergroup.com. July 24th, we're having a field day at Denton, Nebraska at the Brian Burhell Farm. And then um, presenters in town in that afternoon, you can go to the Grace Master Group. It's free. You can sign up to come. If you want to sponsor, they can sponsor it. Um, we love what we're doing. And we're we're really vested into this, this natural way of, of being profitable. And, and uh, we couldn't do it without groups like this that get our word out and let us ramble on for 45 minutes. So if there's any questions, I would love to have them. All right. Um, we do have a question, Del. It says, it sounds like your bales are alfalfa and other non-natives. Do you use native seed? I heard native grasses are more nutritional than non-native grasses. Oh yeah, totally. And that's exactly what we're trying to get back to um, is the, is the native state of the, of the prairie. So we, a lot of the bales that we use now are just like where we had that picture of where I said, we never seeded anything. We just had little bales. So those would have been all warm season seeds. Uh, the alfalfa is actually, we use that in the clover where we've got the warm season now to bring diversity there. But yeah, the warm season deal is absolutely the perfect way to go. We need a need a nice diverse balance between a lot of warm seasons, some cool, some legumes. And so yeah, where whatever it needs, we'll take the bale that uh, is going to help that that particular area the most. So that's a great question. Fantastic. Um, also, you guys may have noticed that Kian launched the poll. If you guys don't mind filling that out while we're all together here. Um, that'd be wonderful. And then, yeah, wrapping up, are there any more questions or comments for Dell today while we've got him? Let's see. I'm not seeing anything right now. Um, but we have your information shared there, Dell. So if there is any questions that come up later, please send them through. If we've got any, you know, we will send those through to you too. Um, and yeah, I just want to thank you for your time today. That was a really great presentation. I enjoyed it. Um, and I hope everyone else did too. So thank you for joining us this morning. Absolutely. Yeah. Get a hold of Carrie or myself. We would love to help you guys and answer any questions and as always we appreciate what you guys are doing and thank you for having us oh let's take a peek um oh i got kicked off i missed q a thank you this is great oh um just somebody saying this was great so yeah cool. thank you guys everybody enjoy the rest of your day thank you bye